Thanks for all of you uh, for coming tonight. I uh, appreciate it on such a windy evening uh, out there. But uh, So this is a presentation I developed uh, last uh, spring for the Northfield uh, Public Library when they did a, uh, a St. Patrick's Day uh, thing with uh, uh, Laura McKenzie and some other... Uh, the whole idea of this is, I won't be diving deep into issues, but I thought it would be kind of neat to just do a quick overview of Irish history because it will expose you to different topics that you may want to follow up and explore on your own, but it also gives a context over time because so often we study history and it's 50 years ago, 100 years ago, so I thought it'd be fun to go all the way back and just touch on the, the highlights uh, as we go along. So, one of the things that I find people are confused by the uh, the names of the British Isles and the various subdivisions thereof. Uh, so being an old uh, uh, high school history teacher, I always got to start with the basics and, and work from there. So the, uh, uh, of course the geographical names, the British Isles, which includes uh, the island of Great Britain, or Britain, Ireland, and a lot of small islands around so that's the geographic terms when you hear those. The political ones, uh, when you hear of the United Kingdom, that's the official government of England, uh, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So think of it as the United States. These are the four states of the United Kingdom from in terms of they have separate governments, but they the federal government is the uh, United Kingdom. And then, of course, the Republic of Ireland uh, is a separate uh, republic and governmental entity. So, um, so let's go way back uh, for a while. The uh, the last ice age uh, ended about thirteen thousand years ago, and I thought this map was a, a fairly good uh, <clears throat> example of where the the extent of the uh, ice sheets uh, went in northern Europe. I've seen other maps that show all of Ireland occupied by ice sheets probably a little bit earlier than this time period. And, um, but it gives you some sense of what uh, was covered during that last uh, ice age. Uh, and keep in mind, that was also happening in Minnesota about the exact same time in terms of the glaciers uh, melting away and uh, Minnesota Lake disappeared. Anybody know where Minnesota Lake used to be? Not the city, the lake. Basically, around Mankato it was all a glacier lake, and then when Lake Agassiz melted away, it, it drained north. So, <clears throat> the uh, and one of the fascinating things that uh, after the glaciers receded, there uh, this is Ireland, of course, in Britain. Uh, a lot of people don't realize Dogger Land was a landmass that was occupied uh, by human societies, agricultural groups, and so forth. It was a uh, land bridge uh, between Europe and the island of uh, Britain, and so forth. And <clears throat> it was wiped out uh, about 8,200 years ago uh, and when there was a tsunami because of a uh, under, uh, undersea landslide that created a tsunami and just opened that whole North Sea and the English Channel. So I thought that was kind of curious. And, and there's a tie to uh, uh, Minnesota and the glaciers that reside, but that's another night. <laughs> so, but I thought it was one of the more fascinating things, but basically created the isolation of the, of the British islands from the uh, uh, mainland of uh, Europe. So, let's talk about people in Ireland. This is <coughs> kind of a fascinating, I don't know if many of you have heard of Newgrange in uh, the uh, eastern end of Ireland, about 50 miles north of Dublin. And Newgrange was a, uh, um, a monument, about an, oh, an acre uh, in size, that was both a burial and religious uh, grounds. So if you think of an ancient cathedral, uh, this was it, and it predated the pyramids and uh, 
the monuments in uh, uh, England and so forth. So, and if you remember from the uh, some of the movies that have, uh, like the Raiders of the Ark have, they go into this tomb and this light comes through. That's where this was the first known uh, monument to do that, where uh, they have a roof box, and on the winter solstice, the sun comes in and goes to the back chamber and lights it up. That's the only time wow. it's a real religious, mythical thing. So who these people were and what they were doing in Ireland uh, in 5,200 years ago uh, is still not known, but there were a lot of these archaeological sites through Europe, not of this size, but there was obviously some group with a lot of engineering uh, and a complex religious political organization to be able to create something like this uh, that far back. So what Ireland, the people most associated with Ireland is the uh, Celts or Celts, depending on your uh, social class. It's Celt if you're in the upper class and Celts if you're just a, a basketball uh, fan or something. So, but that's, so, and uh, as you can see from the, the this map, the uh, uh, Celts, uh, were throughout Europe. They started out in Middle Europe, uh, Southern Europe area, um, thousand year BC or before, uh, and expanded uh, not only westward, but also, you don't see it on this map, over towards India as well. The, uh, and the <coughs> uh, Celts occupied the, the Iberian Peninsula, France, Germany, or parts of Germany, not all of it, I think they sacked Rome once or twice. Of course, everybody did. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you're an outlaw, you invaded uh, Rome. But um, the interesting thing is that they were a cultural and language group. They were not a unified political uh, force. So that's that. Uh, the agricultural uh, culture, uh, like I say, the language and so forth. But for whatever reasons, it burst out of, like uh, groups tended to do, out of a particular area and expanded, uh, in this case, for our purposes, westward into Ireland. And there's still remnants of uh, these Celtic uh, areas, uh, northwestern Spain. Uh, there's actually a, somebody was telling me they bought a bagpipe there, but there's a small province in northern Spain that was not conquered. Uh, I don't believe by the uh, Islamic invasions, but there's Brittany and another sm a number of small uh, Celtic areas, Wales, and of course Scotland are uh, uh, Celtic countries as well. This is just one more representation of the, uh, and of course, in terms of exact boundaries, it's hard to tell uh, today. It's not like you would have a, you know, the hard line from Germany to France and so forth. So. It, kind of spread around, but it gives you a flavor of how uh, uh, different it was. And if you see when the, the, the Celts were in, in Ireland, Carthage was still existing. The Romans hadn't wiped them out yet, uh, so it gives you an idea of how old that area is. The, uh, so the, <coughs> for uh, hundreds of years, uh, the Celts were pretty much in control of the British Isles, but they were all tribal. It's tribal society, which means they were warring amongst each other all the time and so forth. There wasn't a centralized government. But when the Romans came, uh, about 55 BC, uh, it was a major game changer for all of the British Isles, even though they didn't conquer at all. But they brought with them uh, the, the Roman culture, the language, the education, the written language, I should say, uh, which is extremely important. The uh, engineering skill to build roads and buildings and walls and so forth. Um, and uh, towards the end of the Roman uh, uh, occupation of what was mainly England, the uh, the religion, Christianity, they, so they brought Christianity to the to the British Isles, which was also a huge uh, cultural. Uh, change 
there, but <clears throat> oftentimes there's not a lot of discussion about the impact of the Romans on the British Isles, but it was, it was quite significant. The beginning, uh, uh, and at the end of the, pretty close to the end of the Roman era, was the start of the Christian era in, in Ireland itself. And this was a huge change for the culture in Ireland, as, and as we'll see, other parts of the British Isles in, in Europe as well. The, uh, uh, of course, historically, St. Patrick's been the main identified uh, individual as kind of the, the change agent uh, for Christianity in Ireland, and of course, uh, is known for the shamrock uh, as a means of interpreting the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and what we used to say, Holy Ghost, now it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, uh, and the, uh, but uh, Patrick wasn't the other, wasn't the only major figure in the conversion of Ireland to Christianity. Uh, St. Bridget was also uh, a very significant uh, individual in terms of uh, the conversion process and the spread of, uh, of literate uh, Christian uh, culture. And both of these, uh, had significant impact because the Irish liked to claim they had the, a green conversion, meaning they didn't use the sword to convert, force people to convert to uh, uh, Christianity. But they did, uh, and St. Patrick, of course, was from uh, uh, what was today England as a Roman. People say, well, if he was Roman, that must mean he's Italian. And the Italians are trying to claim him. But, uh, but keep in mind, you could be a Roman and you could be Spanish, you could be Italian, or you could be a Syrian or a North African. You know, if you remember, St. Augustine was from North Africa. So that whole area that was Christianized and Romanized, uh, and Patrick uh, had been to Rome before going to Ireland and so forth, and you know the story about him being a slave, uh, captured as a slave and taken to Ireland and escaping back to England. But <clears throat> my interest was kind of this cultural change and the interest in how this, uh, and we talk about these different, the Romans, and we think they're all separate, but even in, you know, 2,000 years ago, there was a lot of interaction in, uh, between groups and certainly the Romans had a big impact there. And this was the golden age for Ireland. The, <clears throat> this early Christian period, and you see this map, and I don't expect you to try to read the details, but it's basically monasteries and convents and uh, religious sites throughout Ireland. And the, um, besides the rich religious significance of it was also the cultural that uh, the religious people were the intelligentsia. Uh, of Ireland and, and the other countries. They were the literate people. They could read and write Latin. Um, they were obviously well-educated, so forth. And for some reason, it really had an impact very quickly uh, on the Ireland and the, the Irish population. Uh, this is a good example of uh, an uh, abbey that actually is relatively new, but gives you an idea. Glenstall Abbey is still uh, active as, a, as an abbey, both for, as a monastery and a boys' uh, school. Uh, and very, uh, uh, like I say, uh, high-end, literate uh, school that's uh, with very high standards. The, um, and of course, the Book of Kells, if you want one document or that's representative of what I'm talking about in terms of the culture and the literacy, uh, it's the Book of Kells because, of course, there's no printing presses yet, and everything was handwritten. And the monks in the monastery would try to <coughs> elaborate and create works of art as well as just replicating or duplicating the, the Bible. And if you uh, look at some of the figures, actually, you'll uh, they're kind of a multicultural because some of these things are actually Coptic uh, Christians from uh, designs from Egypt in that area. So again, it talks about the kind of the spread of culture and language and art uh, over this period of time. 
So <coughs> the uh, and now the <coughs> The Irish aren't much for bragging about things. <laughs> but yeah, they did save civilization. You know, it's a small task, but uh, uh, but what happened, of course, was that the uh, so Christianity moved into the British Isles, into Ireland, and so forth, and then the Dark Ages, with the uh, fall of the Roman Empire uh, in 400 something, um, you know things started to decay, and all these monks and missionaries came flowing out of Ireland to Britain and France, Germany, so forth, and actually for the kings of all these small kingdoms in, in Europe at that time, uh, it was kind of a trendy thing to have an Irish monk as an in-house scholar, if you will, uh, in terms of uh, uh, literacy and conversion of uh, populations. Uh, <clears throat> this is a great example, and of course there's a, a big connection with Faribault to uh, Würzburg, Germany. Well, the patron saint of uh, Würzburg is St. Killian, and St. Killian was an Irish uh, uh, monk priest who was invited by the king to come and help convert the population and so forth, and he had a couple of assistants and so on, and so he arrived and the, uh, everything was going fine, they're converting the population and things or schools are being set up and it's more literate and so forth. And, um, but one day the king of this small province of around Würzburg came to Killian and said, you know, I like what you're doing, you're doing a great job. Now I'm making up this dialogue, but this is kind of what happened. <laughs> so uh, he said, you know, you're doing a great job. Uh, people are converting to Christianity. They're, they're a little less violent uh, and, and so forth, and they're uh, going to services and, and so forth. But, you know, I got one favor to ask of you. It's, it's not a big deal. I know you'll, you won't have any problem with it. He said, well, what's that? He says, well, you know, I'm married. I'm happily married and so forth. But I want a second wife. You know, that's not a big deal. We've always done that here in Germany. You know, we've always had multiple wives. And, with, you know, I'm sure you'll kind of go along because, you know, we work so well together. And Killian says, no, nah, I don't think that's going to work. We don't do it that way. You've got to stick with your wife. You can't have two or three wives. Well, long story short, uh, uh, the king had uh, 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 Killian's head and body separated uh, oh, and uh, <laughs> killed his two assistants and so forth. What caused a huge opera rising against the, the king and uh, today in Würzburg, Germany, there's a big summer festival for St. Killian. Nobody remembers who the king was. <laughs> but uh, he had got his immortality. In fact, there's uh, a huge church that they redid and the graves uh, sort of a uh, sarcophagus of the for St. Killian and his assistants is there and so forth. Of course they Germans being industrious they turned it into a t tourism opportunity. Yeah. 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 But um, and everybody knows the story of the re <coughs> relationship between Würzburg and Faribault and uh, uh, after World War II the uh, uh, Former uh, headmaster Chaddick was the head of the uh, the German or the American occupation of this area of Germany, and of course after the war the uh, Germans were starving to death. They didn't have good clothing. They were devastated, and so forth. And uh, Mrs. Beebe, the wife of General Beebe, wrote to the people of Faribault and said, "Can you help us?" Mm -hmm. Uh, we need food and clothing, and so they used the Buckham Library as a uh, reception area for clothing and food and uh, kind of the uh, unofficial care packages that went to uh, uh, Germany. And um, in Würzburg, they still remember that in their museum. They've got a Faribault display area and, you know, uh, um, so things were going pretty well for the Irish and for Europe in this time period of about 400 to 800 AD in terms of the spread of knowledge and uh, 
higher levels of education, and so forth, the, the spread of Christianity. Um, and then the Scandinavians started showing up. <laughs> well, the Vikings, okay, we won't, we shouldn't name any names here, uh, but, uh, um, you know, so the, uh, the Vikings burst out of Scandinavia, uh, and, of course, the Swedes went to the west and formed uh, the Rus, or what is now the Ukraine, and the Russians got their name from the Rus uh, in Moscow, uh, but they were active all the way down to the... Uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea and so forth, and the Norwegians and the Danes went west through northwestern France and the British Isles and so forth. The uh, <clears throat> so this is pretty significant. It's you know if you've studied the Vikings, you know the the, the reason for them bursting out of uh, Scandinavia all at once is uh, a complex, but they're uh, some burst of energy occurred, and they were uh, uh, great warriors and uh, involved in a, a lot of things, getting all the way to Greenland and North America. The, uh, and of course, they were good traders. Besides uh, uh, being uh, murderers and rapists, they were also good, good <laughs> trading. Not the Russians, but uh, uh, so they set up the main trade centers in Ireland. Uh, in Dublin, Limerick, Cork, Waterford, and Wexford. And so, if you go back, so again, you see the trade routes, you can see why that's significant uh, for the Vikings. And one of the reasons they, uh, the Danes and the Norwegians came through this area is, keep in mind that what, what map I showed you over about the Christian monasteries and convents and so forth. Well, given uh, the work that they had done, they had developed a great value in those monasteries and uh, convents and so forth, and not just books, but also uh, a lot of uh, uh, gold and silver and so forth that was kind of easy pickings uh, uh, as they went through there. So, uh, This is a map that shows the uh, what was coming up from the south was the Islamic uh, expansion. Uh, about 630, uh, Islam was uh, created and very quickly, uh, within 100 years, expanded. This is central, south Europe, Greece, Turkey, and not only this area, but also all the way over to India. Conquered North Africa, the Near East, which was mainly Christian, the Iberian Peninsula. And then um, by uh, 733, they were within 100 miles of Paris. And it was Charles Martel, if you remember from your history, who stopped them there at the Battle of uh, uh, Tours, I believe. Um, and so you can see between the uh, Vikings coming down from Scandinavia and the Islamic forces coming up from the east, Europe was kind of sandwiched between uh, some pretty significant invading forces that changed things dramatically uh, throughout uh, Europe. And <clears throat> there's some more literature that's coming up about Irish slaves because that was one of the trading commodities that the Vikings traded with uh, uh, North Africa and Islamic uh, areas, especially women and boys. Uh, but there are other examples of Irish slavery, even in the Caribbean and so forth. And there's a number of books out, I won't go into it in a lot of detail, just to kind of say it's, it's there and uh, it provides some. And of course, slavery is a universal uh, institution uh, in human history, unfortunately, and this was one sidebar uh, to it. Now, I'm not going to go through all the battles and personalities of Irish history. But it's just good to point out that uh, from uh, about 700 to 1700, uh, it was one invasion after another and another conquest and so forth. Uh, the Vikings we've talked about, the Normans who were basically Frenchified Vikings, 
uh, came from northwestern uh, France and they conquered the Battle of Hastings in 1060, 1066 England. Then within a hundred years they conquered Ireland. Uh, the Tudors, which were Henry VIII and his, his daughter Queen Elizabeth I, uh, were part of the Tudor conquest. And this is the first time religion becomes a factor. Before it's just uh, a matter of rating and so forth, but uh, the, the Tudors were the start of the Protestant Reformation in uh, uh, England and uh, the British Isles. Uh, Cromwell, of course, is the uh, uh, Puritan dictator of England and uh, was uh, uh, it's probably the most genocidal uh, conquest of, of Ireland uh, in that time period. And then, of course, the Ulster Scots or Scots-Irish uh, who had moved from Scotland to Ireland. The, basically, uh, the uh, <coughs> English were fighting the Scots and they were always rebelling and they were fighting the Irish and they were always rebelling and somebody got the idea and said, well, why don't we send the Scots to Ireland and the Scots and the Irish can fight each other. <laughs> you know, takes that off our hands. So anyhow, uh, we'll also see that has a big impact on the United States uh, uh, later on as well as uh, Irish history. Um, and it also, uh, um, brought in the uh, religious repression that started in the 1600s with the penal laws and what they called the Protestant uh, ascendancy. Basically, to be in the middle class or upper class in Ireland, you had uh, to be uh, the Protestant faith, preferably Episcopalian or Anglican in uh, England. The, uh, and it was a total uh, elimination of all civil religious mm -hmm. rights uh, even education um, in, uh, in Ireland for the Catholics. Uh, so over a 240 year period that existed, by the 1840s most of the laws had been taken off the books, but of course the, the issues uh, still uh, persisted. And if you wonder why you know, they talk about the Irish and Catholics so much, it's because the Catholic Church then became the only institution that was supporting uh, Irish nationalism. And of course, the Irish are kind of a rebellious group of people, so they, uh, uh, there were quite a few uprisings and rebellions. I'm not going to go through the list, and this is only a partial list, uh, but it gives you a flavor of the types of uh, the various rebellions that took place. Most were unsuccessful, uh, but uh, the, uh, it was pretty significant. So you can imagine if you're just an average uh, Irish farmer and you have all these invasions and then you have all these rebellions and uh, mm -hmm. so forth, it was uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a difficult life to say the least. Uh, for, and this, like I say, went on for about a thousand years. One of the interesting characters was uh, Grace O'Malley, the, the, the pirate queen of County Mayo area. And her family actually were fairly well off Catholics uh, uh, in terms of it. She was well educated, her family is an educated family and uh, fairly wealthy and they made their money through piracy because they were right on the coast of uh, Northwest Ireland and could charge uh, fees for traffic going through and raiding and so forth. But you, the family, the O'Malley clan, was also uh, a little rebellious when it came to the English authorities. And the story is, at one point, the English were able to capture Grace O'Malley, O'Malley and uh, they brought her to England, and she actually had a sit-down and dialogue with Queen Elizabeth I. There's no huh. record of what was said between the two of them, but you can imagine what a fascinating discussion that had to be because Elizabeth allowed her to return to Northern Ireland and uh, I'm sure with uh, promises of uh, payment back to the British and so forth. But it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, kind of character that hasn't had much attention. One of my trips to Ireland, I went with Steve O'Malley who had been the former county administrator in Rice County 
and he was trying to find a connection there to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to claim Grace O'Malley. So. Well, well. Uh, the Great Famine, of course, is the signature Irish memory. If there's one event in all of Irish history that is a unifying um, event, it's, it's the Great Famine. And I was lucky to find uh, this photo of the sculpture in Ireland. I just thought it did a tremendous job of the, representing the terror and the the hunger and you know just I don't know who the artist was, but I just thought it was a uh, amazing representation of what that like was like uh, at that time. The uh, and that's when my ancestors came over from Ireland this, uh, at 1845-1850 period, which as we'll see here, um, I found this chart, which I like charts uh, and. <coughs> So if you look at the, the chart, this goes back to 1600, and the population of Ireland was probably slightly under a million people. Well, you see the line gradually keeps going up, and of course, the two big events that affect the population in Ireland is, one, the Industrial Revolution, of course, uh, improves the uh, material lifestyle of people throughout the, Europe and the, America. Uh, the second thing is the introduction of the potato to Ireland and throughout Europe, and which came from uh, uh, South America with the European explorers and so forth. And the thing about the potato was that it was very easy to plant, very easy to grow. It was high in carbohydrates, uh, and um, so a lot of the peasant populations in Europe became very dependent on uh, the potato. It wasn't just Ireland, but throughout uh, uh, Europe. The <clears throat> so you have those two factors, and the population skyrockets to eight million people mm -hmm. in just two hundred year uh, period. And of course, then eighteen forty-five, they're about forty-four. You have the the blight that attacks the potato and turns it black, and so people who have been uh, overly dependent on the crop, uh, it was disastrous uh, for them, like I say, not only Ireland, but uh, throughout uh, Europe. Uh, the result is about one million people died in those five years, star starvation, other malnutrition, other mm -hmm. diseases, and so forth. About a million people left uh, Ireland, not only from the United States, but Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and other uh, places. And over time, that migration uh, was constant. So that in 1930, the population in Ireland was down to 4.3 million. Uh, here, over here. Uh, so it's gone up uh, somewhat, but I thought it was a you know, we talk about a famine, and it's hard to quantify, but I thought the chart did a fairly good job of, uh, of doing that. So, the, uh, but after the famine, now one of the, with the Industrial Revolution, you also have universal education coming into uh, Ireland and uh, most European American uh, countries. Uh, and it created kind of a cultural revolution in Ireland in the late, uh, 1900s or 1800s, uh, the uh, of literature, theater, uh, a variety of uh, other arts and so forth. James Joyce is probably the most famous Irish uh, author, although um, he was fairly critical of Ireland and so forth. And I know a lot of people who have started to read the novel Uly Ulysses, but I haven't met many people that can finish it. <laughs> it's rather complex, but Joyce and a long list of other uh, authors and uh, artists uh, bloomed, and that was part of that, I could say, a cultural revolution that around uh, all 1880s through the 1920s, and it wasn't just in the Catholic communities, but actually there was kind of a, uh, a period when the Anglo-Irish uh, and uh, Irish Catholics, there was a lot of 
uh, sharing back and forth of cultural things and artistic uh, areas. Of course, the other second big uh, memory of, that you think of with Ireland is the Easter Uprising of 1916, when the Irish nationalists uh, rose up and uh, tried to create uh, an independent country. And of course, in 1916, the English and British were busy with World War I. So he thought, well, this is a great opportunity to have a rebellion uh, and separate Ireland from England. The, <clears throat> well, two problems. One, the Irish population did, did not support the, the rebellion. And number two, it was not a uh, well-managed uh, rebellion for a number of different reasons. Uh, so it failed terribly after a lot of destruction in, in Dublin. The, uh, but the uh, British uh, uh, kind of, uh, the old expression that they, they, they pulled the defeat, defeat out of the jaws of victory by uh, executing a number of the leaders of the uh, uprising, which turned public opinion totally the other way. And all of a sudden the rebels became heroes and martyrs and so forth. And, uh, the, if the British had just thrown him in jail for a few years, it probably would have passed on. But the real um, war for independence was in 1920, uh, and that's when the uprising occurred. Uh, <laughs> my, my former life. <laughs> but when I was uh, uh, on a trip to Ireland, I went to Shanna Golden, where a lot of Vatigans are from, and I stumbled on this hmm. memorial to this Captain Tim Vatigan, and he was a, a young guy in his early 20s who was an IRA uh, captain in um, by 1920, the war for independence was going full bore, was much better organized and so forth than before, um, and <clears throat> I really, kind of sad, fascinating story is he had, uh, he and some of his fellow uh, uh, IRA guys had humiliated some British soldiers. They captured him and basically forced him to walk naked through an Irish town and then let him go. Well, the, the black and tans uh, of the British uh, didn't like it, so they, they heard that he was at home with his mother for Christmas. So they showed up at the front door of his mother's house, and he headed out the back door, running across the field. Well, one of the soldier, soldiers uh, shot him in the back. Oh. And he drops over. They take a door off his mother's house, go out and use a stretcher, bring him back into the kitchen mm -hmm. table, put him there. And he's obviously dying, and his mother says, you have to forgive the soldier who shot you. Mm. And he did, and he passed away. Mm. Mm. Oh, wow. so, but it's uh, huh. uh, just an interesting uh, uh, story. Well, probably not uh, related except maybe 200 years ago or something. <laughs> but uh, um, but I, <clears throat> I've met members of his family s since then, and uh, uh, it's been really an interesting story. But Basically, as a result of the War of Independence, uh, a deal was worked out between the British and the, uh, <coughs> a portion of the Irish uh, uh, rebels that created Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and, of course, like most revolts and revolution, after it's successful, then there's a civil war. So then the Irish had a civil war over how to, who was going to be in charge of the new republic and what issues they were going to have and, and so forth. But it, uh, uh, but it did, that's when, the, that was the birth of the Republic of Ireland. So let's talk about the Irish in the United States. There's a lot more Irish history overseas, but um, the uh, uh, first group, going back to that group of Scots who went to Northern Ireland, um, they left, uh, a lot of them left, not all of them obviously, uh, 
uh, Northern Ireland in the 1700s to come to the United States because uh, they just felt that they, they weren't getting the deal they were promised, uh, uh, so to speak. But um, you can see the uh, uh, Scotch-Irish came into Pennsylvania, where I grew up in western Pennsylvania, there was a lot of Scotch-Irish Scotch uh, Presbyterians and so forth, and basically they very quickly uh, migrated through the Appalachian uh, chain uh, through parts of the south and probably within 200 years groups were in southern California and, and so forth. So it gives you some idea of the, the spread of that, that migration and their influence. <coughs> Uh, the uh, impact, of course, they settled the Appalachian Mountains area, so when you think of hill people uh, uh, of the Appalachians, they're mainly talking about Scotch-Irish. Uh, they were uh, very involved, uh, they were well positioned in, for example, in Pennsylvania when the Industrial Revolution hit after the Civil War, people like the Mellon families and others uh, became very uh, prosperous uh, as, a, as a result. Uh, music, of course, bluegrass music, country western music, hill music, all that is uh, Scotch-Irish uh, uh, background. The, uh, and they're also critical, probably the main ethnic force within the U.S. military uh, up until probably the last 20 years. The, uh, Jim Webb, who was the Secretary of Navy under President Clinton, wrote a book about the Scotch-Irish and focused on the military uh, involvement and, and so forth the, uh, there. And also, um, about 20 U.S. presidents are either uh, full-blooded Scotch-Irish or partial from Andrew Jackson to uh, Barack Obama. Uh, so that was a, probably the, one of the dominant, as well as the English Anglican people in terms of uh, presidents. And of course, being in Rice County, you have to <laughs> <laughs> mention that the Irish claim Jesse James' uh, ancestors. Uh, uh, in uh, Esteed, Ireland, uh, there's a tavern. This is the tavern there. Uh, it's named after Jesse James. They claim that his grandfather uh, lived there and was a smuggler and a bandit and was forced to leave by the British uh, uh, one step ahead of the law, so it was kind of a family tradition, I guess. But how true it is, I don't know, but it's a great story. Uh, the, uh, of course, we talked about uh, Irish-American Catholics, uh, and of course, they were welcomed when they first came. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, <coughs> You know, part of the problem was that a lot of the Irish immigrants were from the western half of Ireland, which was the poorest, and uh, were the most people that their first language was Gaelic. You know, we think of the Irish as English speaking, but uh, back in the day, uh, a large uh, percentage were Gaelic speakers, the, and so they had issues with language when they came, and the Irish that could speak English, you couldn't understand what they were saying anyhow. Uh, the Irish broke, so uh, it created some uh, conflicts uh, in the United States when uh, when they arrived. Uh, and of course, uh, some people claim the Irish had a bit of a chip on their shoulder and so forth. I don't know, but uh, uh, this is the logo from the fight, Fighting Irish of Notre Dame, of course. Uh, uh, but it was a difficult uh, transition in terms of immigration uh, to the United States. Religion was an issue, poverty was an issue, uh, a variety of, uh, of things. Uh, but they were very instrumental in that whole Industrial Revolution uh, era. Uh, and of course, the Civil War was uh, the, the big start of it. Uh, and the, the immigrants, the German and the Irish, uh, basically won the war for the Union because of the number of soldiers that they could provide. And if you recall your Civil War history, the early stages of the Civil War was just a bloodbath, especially the Union mm -hmm. soldiers, because the <coughs> military technology had progressed uh, 
uh, quite a bit, but the military strategists were still 50 years behind, except for the Southern generals. They were the, the real strategists and knew, knew how to fight wars. The Union generals were, you know, until Grant and came along, but that was two or three years. In the meantime, a lot of the, the reason the Union could stay, even stay in the battle was uh, immigrant uh, in numbers and plus the industrial base uh, eventually uh, was very strong. So, and I've seen different numbers here. So uh, proportionally, this is accurate, but if you were to look this up, you might find uh, other uh, figures, but I think it's relatively close. One of the things that <clears throat> was significant too was, of course, you have in Ireland and the United States, the Irish are fairly uh, poor, and there was a uh, woman by the name of Catherine Macaulay who started the Sisters of Mercy in 1831, and most all the religious orders for women in the Catholic Church before this were cloistered, where you basically stay in a convent and you pray and. Uh, so forth. Macaulay was uh, fairly radical and she said, well, this is going to be a, a religious order of service. We're going to go out and serve and help the poor. That's our religious uh, uh, direction. And as a result, uh, developed uh, kind of two branches to uh, uh, the, the order. One was uh, medical care and the second was education. So she, um, um, if you see a hospital with the name Mercy in it, it was probably founded by the Sisters of Mercy. So I think Coat Rapids has a Mercy Hospital and others mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, uh, Sister, er, uh, Sister Macaulay did not come to the United States, but her members of her order did basically in Pittsburgh and then spread out from there. And they created the first national health care system uh, in the country um, and, you know, with the, the nursing order and, and so forth. And <clears throat> the other part of it was their uh, 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 teaching order, teaching side. Uh, and this is, uh, this is my older sister Kathleen and her younger brother, one of her younger brothers, mm -hmm. seven yeah. kids. <laughs> so, and uh, she was she was in the Sisters of Mercy in the early 60s, well, from 1960 to about 66. And after the sixth year, you take your final vows. You gotta make a lifetime commitment then. But that was also the time when new opportunities for women were coming along and the population uh, uh, of uh, nuns just dropped dramatically. Mm -hmm. People left in droves and my sister was one that decided not to take the final vows and went on to become an elementary uh, school teacher. Uh, but they were very effective. They really had a big impact educationally on the poor of, of big cities uh, and so forth. So. <coughs> But the Irish uh, in America also had a big impact on uh, the, uh, the arts, again, as well. Uh, many of you are familiar with Flannery O'Connor. Uh, she's probably one of the top five or seven authors of the 20th century. Uh, doesn't get much attention anymore, but uh, a fascinating story. She's, so she was Irish Catholic and from Georgia. I think that's kind of odd, but remember Georgia was founded as a criminal yeah. uh, compound and a lot of the Irish were criminals, so. Or at least some people thought they were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but she um, was a very talented uh, uh, writer, obviously. She went to the Iowa writing workshop in the 1950s, or 1950. Uh, and that was the place for training American uh, writers. Uh, and uh, uh, she's re referred to as a Gothic Southern writer. So it's an odd, if you read her stories, they're really odd. And you, there's actually religious uh, messages in there, but you really gotta <laughs> figure out 
she's big into grace and how you transfer grace. Uh, and as Pauline mentioned, uh, the <coughs> peacocks uh, uh, are a big religious symbol, not anymore, but there was a time when they were in, uh, going back probably thousands of years. So, but Minnesota, of course, had F. Scott Fitzgerald and all kinds of uh, Percy Walker and others that uh, there. The other part that the Irish got involved with politics, uh, you know, and being in the big cities and so forth, the Tammany Hall and the, uh, they weren't always the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, most uh, admirable in their, uh, sometimes had low issues with corruption, but, uh, but they also uh, took care of the poor. And some of the Irish politicians had this, uh, kind of a certain charisma, and Kennedy and Reagan both did uh, kind of a, a uh, upbeat, uh, uh, not only youthful, but also a cheerful kind of, you know, Humphrey uh, coined the phrase, the joy of politics, but uh, I think I always think of that with Reagan and, and Kennedy both, they had kind of that enthusiasm and uh, desire to, to uh, uh, do well. Uh, the Irish are also involved in a lot of different political movements in the United States. Uh, I picked this slide out because uh, the, uh, <clears throat> this of course is Martin Luther King on a civil rights march in the 1960s. Anybody know who this guy is? Dr. Spock? No. Not Captain Spark. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's the guy that spoiled all of us. Remember the book? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and then uh, <clears throat> to his right here, uh, this is Monsignor Charles Owen Rice, and he was my parish priest uh, when I was in high school in Washington, Pennsylvania. And he was from uh, uh, Ireland and had been active with the labor unions in the 30s and then the civil rights movement. Now my dad, who could have been a little bit cynical, said, yeah, they, he had to leave Ireland because they were going to kick him out if he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was writing, uh, he wrote a lot of books, uh, writing for the Pittsburgh Catholic newspaper into his, well into his 80s and so forth. But So, there are a lot of Irish in Minnesota, uh, regardless of what the Vikings uh, say. About <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> and the, the big name in uh, uh, Minnesota Irish history, of course, is uh, ironically Bishop Ireland, uh, who was the Archbishop in St. Paul and a good part of Minnesota. And it's, um, um, he was kind of the right person at the right time uh, and, and a real leader in terms of he, <clears throat> for example, was part of the progressive wing of Catholicism and had what was called the Americanism approach when dealing with the European Catholics who were more, uh, well, more conservative, more hierarchical, and so forth. And he's saying, look, in America, we've got we to loosen up and you know, work with you know, all, all people and, and so forth. And he was also a builder. Uh, so he built the, uh, was the leader behind the building of the St. Paul Cathedral, uh, uh, which sits on the hill there, higher than the state capitol building. <laughs> but <you> know, <coughs> part of the uh, message of this was not only a religious one of, of God and the traditional Catholic ornamentation and so forth, but it was also kind of a message uh, that uh, the Irish Catholics have arrived. And that was part of the uh, symbolism of it. He also was uh, a leader in the uh, St. Mary's Basilica in Minneapolis as well. Mm -hmm. so, the, uh, and <coughs> Mary uh, Theresa Hagen Hill uh, doesn't get a lot of attention, but she was a major uh, leader in St. Paul and the other areas, both in the Catholic community as well as helping the, the poor. Uh, and she was married to James J. Hill. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. even though James J. Hill was I think a Presbyterian, but she was Catholic. Um, 
And the story is that she was working as a waitress in a small cafe in St. Paul, and he would come in as a young man before he became wealthy, uh, and courted her, and they got married and so forth. So, um, but she was pretty dynamic and pretty active uh, in, uh, in St. Paul, and uh, a driver uh, for a lot of the social services there. So, Eugene McCarthy, people remember him from 1968. Uh, Life magazine, I found this uh, uh, somewhere along the line. And <coughs> I saved it and it finally came in, came in handy. Uh, so, Gene McCarthy was probably, well, he was the first Catholic elected from Minnesota as a United States Senator. I think maybe the only one, but I'm not sure. Uh, <coughs> But of course he's famous for the 1968 presidential election uh, where he was challenging Humphrey and you had uh, the unusual situation that Minnesota had the two competing candidates for the Democratic nomination for president. Uh, and McCarthy uh, came out of St. John's University, considered himself an intellectual. Um, you know, Humphrey was kind of a, uh, guy who loved to mingle with people, apparently had a photographic memory. If he met you once, he could tell you five years later he'd name all your kids to you and so forth. Uh, but, uh, but McCarthy was a little more distant uh, kind of guy. So <clears throat> those of you who are newest, uh, what's unusual about this photograph? He's so actually, front. He's he's front. Front. Yeah. He's sitting up front or he should be in back. Should be in back. I don't know what else. Have you ever seen any French fur traders dressed like this? No. <laughs> so he's got a white shirt and tie on and a suit. Yeah. yeah. And uh, his canoes uh, from herders. <laughs> you know herders, uh, uh, so they were the. Uh, I mean, you can't see it here, but if I looked at this real close, one of his assistants, young, young guy, was in this canoe, and the look on his face is, oh, I wish I'd get this over with. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyhow, he's a fascinating uh, uh, yeah. figure uh, uh, politically and involved in a, a great many things, and was part of that Humphrey uh, group who started in 1948 and formed the DFL merged the farmer labor and DFL party and so forth and so on. So, you know, Catholicism and had what was called the Americanism approach when dealing with the European Catholics who were more, uh, more conservative, more hierarchical and so forth. And he's saying, look, in America, we've got we to loosen up and you know, work with you know, all, all people and, and so forth. And he was also a builder. Uh, so he built the, uh, was the leader behind the building of the St. Paul Cathedral, uh, uh, which sits on the hill there, higher than the state capitol building. <laughs> but you know, part of the uh, message of this was not only a religious one of, of God and the traditional Catholic ornamentation and so forth, but it was also kind of a message uh, that uh, the Irish Catholics have arrived, and that was part of the uh, symbolism of it. He also was uh, a leader in the uh, St. Mary's Basilica in Minneapolis as well. Mm -hmm. so, the, uh, and <coughs> Mary uh, Theresa Hagen Hill uh, doesn't get a lot of attention, but she was a major uh, leader in St. Paul and the other areas, both in the Catholic community as well as helping the, the poor, uh, and she was married to James J. Hill. So, um, even though James J. Hill was, I think, a Presbyterian, but she was Catholic. Um, and the story is that she was working as a waitress in a small cafe in St. Paul, and he would come in as a young man before he became wealthy. Uh, courted her and they got married and so forth. So, um, but she was pretty dynamic and pretty active uh, in, uh, in St. Paul and uh, a driver uh, for a lot of the social services there. So, Eugene McCarthy, people remember him from 1968. Uh, 
Gene McCarthy. People remember him from 1968. Uh, Life magazine. I found this uh, uh, somewhere along the line. And <coughs> I saved it and it finally came in, came in handy. Uh, so Gene McCarthy was probably, well, he was the first Catholic elected from Minnesota as a United States Senator. And I think maybe the only one, but I'm not sure. Uh, <coughs> But of course, he's famous for the 1968 presidential election uh, where he was challenging Humphrey. And you had uh, the unusual situation that Minnesota had the two competing candidates for the Democratic nomination for president. Uh, and McCarthy uh, came out of St. John's University, considered himself an intellectual. Um, you know, Humphrey was kind of a. Uh, guy who loved to mingle with people, apparently had a photographic memory. If he met you once, he could tell you five years later he'd name all your kids to you and so forth. Uh, but, uh, but McCarthy was a little more distant uh, kind of guy. So <clears throat> those of you who are the newest, uh, what's unusual about this photograph? He's sitting up front. He's sitting up front. Or he should be back. Should be. I don't know what else. Have you ever seen any French fur traders dressed like this? No. So he's got a white shirt and tie on and a suit. Yeah. And uh, his canoes uh, from herders. You know herders. So they were the. Uh, you can't see it here, but if I looked at this real close, one of his assistants, young, young guy, was in this canoe, and the look on his face is, oh, I wish I'd get this over with. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyhow, he's a fascinating uh, uh, figure uh, uh, politically and involved in a, a great many things, and he was part of that Humphrey. Uh, group who started in 1948 and formed the DFL, merged the farmer labor and DFL party and so forth and so on. So this is a picture of uh, St. Paul a couple years, day, years ago at the St. Patrick's Day uh, mm -hmm. um, parade and this uh, signifying that uh, the Irish still are willing to get out and party and identify. And, uh, and again, they're not uh, prejudiced. You don't have to be Irish to celebrate St. Patrick's, St. Patrick's Day and have a good time with it. The, um, uh, if you're looking for uh, all kind of a popular histories of things, this is a pretty good book you can get out of the, the libraries on Irish-American culture and of course there's a lot of literature, both historical as well as uh, in, in writing. So, uh, and there's also I don't know if everybody's familiar, I just became familiar with this group, the Celtic Junction Art Center in St. Paul. They, um, they do a lot of music, uh, they have online classes, both well, in person and online class. I just took a Zoom uh, class uh, on Flannery O'Connor, that's why I, I got up to, I knew about her, but I didn't really understand her. So, um, so there's, there's lots of good resources still in, in Minnesota uh, on uh, Irish issues. The, uh, we're going to try to play this uh, clip from the movie. I don't know if many of you heard of it, the, the movie Belfast. If you haven't seen it, it's really worth uh, seeing it. it. It's one of the few m movies about a very tragic situation that's uplifting. I mean, you come out with a good feeling uh, afterwards, and they, so it, it portrays all the problems and issues, but they also the hope and uh, the, the chance to change and, and so forth. Yeah. But obviously, yeah. Fermo yeah. has a, a rich Irish history as well, and Pat can tell you a lot of stories, and mm -hmm. everybody else here uh, probably has stories uh, uh, and so forth. So, yeah, it's just you say for me, it's just. A hobby, and it's it's something fun to do the research and have personal connections with. Uh, but it also helps you understand, you know, just the greater human experience 
which isn't always a good one. <laughs> so uh, human nature being what it is, but uh, it uh, shows one example. Clinton uh, had uh, a similar, you know, he has, he's probably mostly Scotch-Irish, but uh, had some Irish background and, and so forth. And he was probably the one that did the most to broker the peace in Northern Ireland and so forth. So, um, and uh, Barack Obama has uh, Irish uh, ancestry as well. So he's, uh, he did a stop. Yeah, especially uh, right after the famine when there were so many Irish coming. Uh, there's been an article recently about the, what the, you know, the, the movie The Gangs of New York, uh, mm -hmm. but the, just the poverty mm -hmm. and the disintegration of families and splitting things up and it uh, really caused the leadership in the Irish communities, religious and lay, to say, we got to do something. Mm -hmm. That's when they started getting the schools built and, uh, you know, pushing family affairs and so forth, because uh, otherwise it was just chaos. Because mm -hmm. there were no social services mm -hmm. when you came to America then. Well, that were orphans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you had, you know, it was basically either oh, I used to refer to there's uh, Two type of Irish. Uh, uh, one was the lace curtain Irish, the yeah, lace yeah. curtain, mm -hmm. and the other was shanty Irish. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, so even though everybody uh, wants to be Irish, they still, you know, it's like any human social group. Mm -hmm. Everybody tries to find a, a leg up mm -hmm. on some story. Uh, some of you have already heard, but uh, when I was on a trip to uh, Ireland, I. I was in Rotary Club, and so I stopped at a Rotary Club in, in Ireland and went to the, uh, it was at a Holiday Inn or something there. And so I, the concierge was there, and I said, well, I'm here to go to the Rotary Club. He, he says, well, you just wait here, because the, the board of directors for the All-Ireland Rotary is he, meeting here, and they're going to be done in just a minute, and they want to meet you. I said, well, I just came here for the meeting. No, no, here's the so this group comes out of about 10 uh, members, and so we'll stand in a circle, where are you from, and what do you do, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, this one guy looks at me and says, you know, Minnesota, huh? He says, you know, I just biked across Minnesota with a friend of mine who's the publisher of the newspaper in Montevideo, Minnesota. Oh. So really, that's cool. And uh, he said, you know, in fact, I traded uh, bike shirts with a guy on the bike trip, and uh, and I have his shirt and he has my shirt. I said, yeah, I know. He said, what do you mean you know? I've seen your shirt. And the guy you traded your shirt with was my roommate in college. Oh. <laughs> so it was, uh, uh, Small world. Small yeah, he, and the guy was just, you know, about 10 minutes old. Oh. I can't believe uh, <laughs> so, uh, so we made traded contacts, and uh, the next year, my roommate and I and another college friend went back, and this guy lived in Northern Ireland in Cookstown, and you know had us stay at his house, showed us all around. They had a little uh, 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 townhouse up on the north, the Castaways uh, Causeways. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, they said, wow, oh, you go up there and spend a couple of nights and this and that. And they were just great. Uh, and when I was staying at their house, so I figured out how they can party for so long. Because his brother came over from next door. And, you know, we're going and having a little Jameson and so forth there. And, uh, <clears throat> and I noticed his brother, he just kind of goes like this. Sleeps for about 20 minutes, and then he wakes up, and it's like nobody noticed or said anything, and then he was ready to go again. <laughs> so, anyway, well, thank you very much for coming.